dream of a silence, a dream silence, full of murmurs. I don't know, that's all words. Never wake, all words. There's nothing else, you must go on. That's all I know. They're going to stop. I know that well. I can feel it. They're going to abandon me. It will be the silence for a moment, a good few moments, or it will be mine, the lasting one, that didn't last, that still lasts. It will be I. You must go on. I can't go on. Okay, I've unmuted myself. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's begin, right. Um, so um, our special guest today is uh, Professor Mark Byron. Uh, good evening, Professor Byron, and um, good morning and good evening to everyone attending this discussion from different parts of the world. Um, so uh, Mark Byron is Associate Professor in the Department of English at the University of Sydney and uh, an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. He teaches and publishes across the genres and practices of modernism, prose, poetry, drama, and film, as well as textual and editorial theory. He's author of the monographs Ezra Pound's Erogena, uh, which came out in 2014, and Samuel Beckett's Geological Imagination, which is, of course, in the press and is coming out very soon. Uh, and with Sophia Barnes produced the critical manuscript uh, edition, Ezra Pounds and Olga Ruge's The Blue Spill in 2019. Uh, Mark co-edited a dossier with uh, Stefano Rosinoli on Samuel Beckett and the Middle Ages in the Journal of Beckett Studies in 2016, and is editor of the essay collection, The New Ezra Pound Studies 2019, uh, which came out uh, uh, through Cambridge uh, University Press. And he's also the president of the Ezra Bound Society. It's such a pleasure, Mark, to finally have you here on the screen. And uh, Professor Byron, uh, thank you for agreeing to this interview immediately for such an amazing surprise. Um, so in our discussion today on geological imagination, uh, excavating Beckettian things, and that's uh, how um, I, haven't, I have termed it, and that's what we'll discuss. So we'll try to locate the essence of uh, uh, Professor Byron's fabulous book, uh, Samuel Beckett's Geological Imagination, uh, which I had the very good opportunity of reading. Um, and if you have any questions, please write them down in the chat box. They will be taken up towards the end of the session. Uh, so can we uh, begin, Mark? Certainly. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'll just begin by thanking you, um, <laughs> Professor Datta, for um, firstly thinking of this event and inviting me to it. And um, yeah, I very, I really appreciate your graciousness and your enthusiasm. So <laughs> it's not, not every day that somebody wants to talk about rocks, uh, but that day is upon us. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here and I'm really uh, encouraged and grateful for your um, energy and enthusiasm so thank you yeah thank and you thanks for everybody for else for being here as well um yeah. we're phoning in from different time zones so it's a it's a wonderful thing zoom in that it means that we're not all jet lagged at, a, at conferences <laughs> around the world um but we suffer other kinds of dislocations i guess temporally and spatially as a result <laughs> so i especially appreciate people's um uh phoning in today Okay, yeah, thank you so much. So, yeah, let's begin with uh, uh, our, our um, questions. So, um, my first question to you, uh, Professor Byron, is, so we can convincingly say that in Beckett, uh, the terrestrial precedes the essence uh, and existence of man. Uh, so what, do you, what and why do you think Beckett keeps uh, returning to the geological and uh, perceives the text as a terrestrial plane on which we have the solitary individual, uh, you know, speaking and often physically inert. Yeah, uh, thanks. That's a wonderful opening question. Um, I'm going to assume not everybody here has had a chance to read the book yet. So uh, I'll just begin, if you don't mind, by giving a, a, just the briefest of sketches. So this book, Samuel Beckett's Geological Imagination, um, is a short monograph uh, in a, a new series uh, from Cambridge called Elements. The, the idea is that it's, it's for something that's too big for a conference paper or a, a journal article, but not the, not the same size as a regular monograph. So you, you have something sort of in between, um, which, has, which means you have to focus your ideas uh, quite, um, quite quickly. And I decided that uh, I wanted to look at geology and geological and archaeological images in Beckett because they run all the way through his uh, writing career from the very beginning. 
and um, but given the constraints of space, I thought I'll look at the late texts and see what they're doing with regard to this. And uh, as it turned out, I hit upon that was a very happy choice because the the last sort of three major prose texts that Beckett produced, um, Company, Il Seen, Il Said and Worst Would Ho, uh, kind of taken together oftentimes as a sort of a second trilogy, although Beckett always disavowed that term. Um, and they, to me, they seem to pretty much perform a, a, a kind of a, a critical re-examination of Beckett's writing career. So they're kind of metatextual in a sense. Um, so to, to get to Asajit's question, you know, this idea of uh, stones and earth and so forth preceding humankind. And so why is it that Beckett keeps returning to this? Well, I would link it to this kind of, you know, critical reflection upon his career actually in these last, in these final three major texts. Uh, so you have, this uh, return to a still point, if you like. Uh, you, many of you would know some of those tropes of uh, returning to the womb, having prenatal uh, memories. This is something that Beckett uh, talks about in his, as a biographical experience. And this is something that he, he sort of sublimates into fiction at various points uh, in his writing career. So you do have this kind of tendency towards returning to pre, pre-existence, if you like. Uh, and then, of course, you have that be in the other direction, the being towards death. You know, we are born astride the grave and so on. Um, so the earth kind of figures as this kind of return, if you like. Uh, so it's, an, it's a point of origin and it's a return. So in that sense, I see these final three texts as, as enacting this, in a sense, uh, in, a, in a literary sense. He's returning to the beginnings of his writing career as well as reaching the end of that career. So geology and archaeology function quite well as um, as kind of metaphors of this process but they're also they're also embodied they're also you know physical objects and physical processes that are historical but also um, forward moving and and moving into the future so in that sense it's not necessarily a cycle but it's this kind of a sense of uh, return in in some way so that's that idea of um, the lithic or the rock-like being tied to the literary, how one might appraise a career in writing. And um, Beckett does so by this very, very dense kind of uh, thinking through of his earlier texts, uh, thinking through of the canon. Uh, there's a lot of intertextuality in these texts, that's sometimes a little bit beneath the surface, a rethinking of the history of language and a rethinking of the, the project of, of attempting to be human, if you like. So, sorry, that's a bit verbose, but that's in a nutshell. Right. So, so, so let me take the liberty of saying that the, the, the lithic vocabulary you know, often transforms the texts into stone tablets, uh, uh, if you may. So stylistically speaking, is this how Beckett concerns himself with the history of language and humans and natural objects? Yeah, the, the idea of writing becoming stone, um, that does appear throughout uh, many of his texts or certain of his texts, um, sometimes in the text themselves, sometimes in the, the manuscripts that don't quite, th those, those uh, motifs don't quite make it into his texts. Uh, what is a great example of that, where um, the figure Quinn, who was the kind of the predecessor of, of Mr. Knott, uh, has this kind of uh, daydream of the letters on his tombstone sort of fleeing from him in this, bizarre kind of, you know, so it's as though, you know, this inscription of his life, this representation of, uh, you know, his post, uh, post-mortem body uh, losing its kind of inscriptive force. It becomes anonymous and then, then at one with the earth again. So th there, is a, there is a kind of a tendency to, to link writing and stone in Beckett. Uh, it comes up in Echo's Bones, the story, the, posthumous, the posthumously published story. Uh, and, and in a few other places. And I, I guess I've sort of telescoped that into thinking about the history of writing. And I mean, it's quite significant, uh, partly because of the durability of stone, um, but many, uh, certainly in the Mediterranean basin, some of the earliest uh, inscriptions are stone tablets. I mean, that's because they last longer than, than most other um, surfaces. Um, and that they're often legal codes, actually. So we're thinking of um, Sumerian and Babylonian. The, the Code of Hammurabi is one of the most famous examples of that. Um, so we've got this kind of 
history of writing sort of lurking somewhere in there as well um, in terms of you know linking script and stone uh, he doesn't limit himself to that though actually as we find out as, as we sort of move through particularly in Worstwood Ho we end up with something that's a lot more uh, ephemeral and uh, it's more like a membrane. Uh, I've, I've likened the, the, the concluding paragraph of Worstwood Ho um, to this kind of a camera obscura. So it's sort of looking through a projection, if you like. So it's a kind of a dematerialization of writing or of imagining a, a narrative world. Um, so we've got that kind of dialectic going on between stone and earth on the one hand and um, light and you know a dematerialized uh, sort of conception of writing on the other uh, right so so again talking of beckett's company um, because that's also one of the focuses of your uh, book uh, how is the narrator utilizing his geological surrounding to charge the process of fictional and semi-fictional production because it's everything happens you know in the dark or in the concerning regarding the concerns regarding the dark or the stories of the dark in the dark so that is a continuous presence and the, the narrative comes as a sort of lucid out of that concrete that's right. I mean, it's a it's a text that's its setting is really dematerialized. It's not happening in a closed space, as far as we know. Um, it's it's in the dark in a space. That's all we have. So we don't have um, characters or figures standing in a landscape or enclosed in a stone structure or anything like that. All we're all we're left with is voices, um, a body, at least one body, um, and darkness. So. That's a good question because this this kind of differentiates company from ill seen, ill said, and worst would ho, where you do have you know pretty in different ways you do have physical spaces and a certain earthiness that sort of manifested there. In company, it works through memory. It's it's the narrator and or the lying figure, the figure lying on the ground. Um, thinking about uh, the Wicklow Mountains and the countryside and the various rock formations and uh, geological formations as well as uh, Neolithic formations. And this, this sort of harks back to, as most of us would recognise, this is something that harks back to Beckett's childhood, tramping the hills with his father and then tramping the hills later uh, remembering his father. And this this kind of again gets uh, transformed into narrative form in a number of the novels actually. Um, there's a little bit in Watt and there's a little bit in, in the trilogy as well. Um, so there is this, this sense of, uh, and some of the short prose, so there is this kind of return to this landscape throughout his career and here he is sort of stripping away a, a kind of a, a narrative scene if you like and it's the mode of narration that is kind of reenacting these these various narrative scenes that have that have recurred throughout his career, and that, of course that are not equivalent to or identical with, but but related to um, his biography. So um, I'm just trying to think how else I might express that. Um, there's a real preponderance of burial imagery, I think, in company, and it's that idea of you know, of course, you can bury memories. And you can excavate memories, and you could certainly you, that that's very open to psychoanalytic kind of interpretations. I think, uh, among others, uh, which is a direction I haven't purposefully haven't gone there because other people do it much better than me. Um, <laughs> but th this idea of burial and exhumation, or um, you know, this idea of what it is to be a a figure, what, not necessarily what it is to be a human, but what it is to be a narrative figure, seems very tied up with this idea of burial. And I was thinking about, um, you know, discussions about what makes us human, what, what, how are we different to all the other animal forms on earth? And, you know, the classic answer to that is, well, we use language, but of course, gorillas can sign, as we know, and uh, dolphins and whales develop certain kinds of Communic verbal communication. So that, that, that borderline is a little bit sketchy, I think. Um, but we are the only species that buries its dead. Um, so this idea of marking time and the life and the end of life uh, in a ceremonial and, you know, in, in a sense, an archaeological way is, is something that, that does distinguish us from just about um, any other species. Um, I was reading just recently about 
um, the discovery of a, of a new subspecies in South Africa, the Homo nalendi. This was in 2013, this was discovered in a cave uh, in South Africa. Uh, and this subspecies existed about 300,000 years ago. And it's the earliest documented record of, of any kind of burial. Um, th this cave was actually a burial site. So it was a discovery of a new subspecies, a Homo species um, signified uh, and, and it was a, a burial site that, that, was, um, that was found to, to lead to this, um, this discovery. So th th that's another thing, what it is to be human and what it is to distinguish ourselves from, from other life forms um, and where that breaks down. Of course, this is something that goes on in Beckett as well, this sort of breakdown between the human and the animal and of, or the, the distinction between human and animal. And of course, you could take that further and talk about the mineralogical as well, which is which is part of what I've discussed in in the book. Uh, right. So also in Westward Ho, uh, Westward Ho, we, we there's a, there's a it's a far more complicated text. Uh, uh, in that it imagines the natural setting and the ecological location along with the materialization of its characters. So if humans, so this is my question perhaps, that if humans are based on binaristic differences and phenomenological parameters, do we then find Beckett cancelling the anthropocentric with the, with, the, with the ecological? I mean, is there a, you know, if, does one cancel the other? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, Well, I, I think we're, we're coming up to one of the big uh, questions about all of Beckett's fiction, I think, uh, and particularly this, these last texts, and that is, you know, what's going on with the narrators? But maybe we'll leave that for um, a slightly later time. Um, yeah, Worst Would Ho, is it about humans or is it about characters? It's, I would say it's about the formation of character, but of course, what the narrator's doing and the kind of identity that we ascribe to the narrator complicates that, um, that, that, um, that reading. Um, I would say in terms of the this kind of relation between the anthropological and the ecological, uh, I, I think there's, there's this kind of, I won't say it's a dialectical relationship, but there's certainly some kind of symbio symbiotic relationship going on there, where uh, movement between earth and life is going on quite frequently in these in these texts. Uh, for those of you who are aficionados of 1960s uh, cartoons. If you remember Rocky and Bullwinkle, I don't know if this is heresy to talk about Rocky and Bullwinkle. You remember that, there's that beautiful scene where they kind of, they, I can't remember how it happens, but they end up flying through the air and then they're buried in the ground and then they kind of rise up out of the ground again. And I, that's that's a kind of the best analogy I can think of for what's going on in Worstwood Ho, where you do have this kind of movement between ground and um, I, I guess human expression. So the ground of the physical ground um, and then the ground of the text, if you like, the, the, what, what grounds the, the literary. So I don't think, in Worstwood Ho, I think what Beckett's doing here is um, taking the archaeological and the human a little bit a step further and, and kind of denaturing both. Neither are quite fully realised, actually. It is a quite an abstract text. And this, this sort of gets to the camera obscura at the end. It's about the process, if you like, the process of worlding. What is it to sort of create a nar narrative world? What is it to condition um, your perceptions into um, uh, the possibility of a world? And this, this sort of, I see the very end of Worstwood Ho sort of harking all the way back to that, uh, to the German letter, actually, to uh, what's that, 1937, um, where that, that famous phrase, you know, puncturing the, the surface of language to get the, the something or the nothingness behind. And this camera obscura image, you know, the pinhole, uh, the sheet with the pinhole, it, it, it looks minimal, but it actually projects a world. Um, and, it, and, it, and it actually projects an inverted world. It's not realism, it's not reflecting what's behind, it's inverting what's behind. So I think, I think Beckett's playing on that uh, at the end. And again, you've got this kind of, the possibility of moving between the earth and the human or the uh, anthropological and the ecological via this process of, of writing and of conceiving of the text surface. So writing is, is to, to sort of produce a world, if you like, um, or to speculate on a world.
Uh, right, and also personally speaking, um, you know, personally something strikes me as as quite eccentric in Il Sin Il Said. Uh, so there is a there's a perpetual threat of the uh, old woman, you know, to the old woman converting into a stone. But we are also looking at the stone gradually resembling the woman. So their movement could be a flaw of vision. Of course, we know that. Uh, so both might be standing, both moving. So why are geological sight uh, and subjective creation collapsing? into one number is is my question yeah that's a that's a great question well this is where we get to the narrator i think because uh as far as we know i, I well I, there's a lot of ambiguity in that text with regard to what's actually going on and maybe that's maybe that's the question you know are we there is a compulsion to try to figure out what is going on but maybe that's not quite the right question um so you have the enigma of the text i think is the narrator so you've got this sense of uh, the narrator of you'll seen you'll said as, as kind of functioning in that, you know, eye of prey kind of narrative mode that we get earlier in Beckett, uh, particularly in texts like The Lost Ones. That's a pretty good analogy, I think. Um, but, but is also filled with a kind of uncertainty about what he, what he is looking at. I would, I would gender the, the, the narrator as, as male here. And in fact, almost all of Beckett's narrators, I would gender as male. Um, if you remember in The Lost Ones, there, there are points, uh, you know, it's a very assertive text in terms of what the narrator is um, describing, uh, but, but he loses his uh, way <laughs> at various points and, and can't really cope with the information that he seems to be uh, given with regard to the uh, functioning of the, the closed space. He doesn't it's an unknown commutator, it's an invisible source. So, so there's this kind of sense of a forensic analysis of the situation that he's describing, but also a, a kind of butting up against the limits of that and, and having to sort of fall into the language of magic, actually, at certain points. Um, and it, so that's the lost ones. In Il Senior said, I think we've got a kind of a next generation of that, that sort of thing going on. We know that the narrator's vision is kind of stymied in some way because he talks about the, uh, what's the word, the haze. We're not sure whether that's because there is a, you know, a, an atmospheric condition, a fog or something like that, that's obstructing his view, whether it's an epistemological thing, whether it's a, an ontological thing, uh, but it is about a perception, a perception from the narrator. So uh, that's that's the big question. Is is the, the haze that, that um, stops short the possibility of the narrator viewing the situation accurately, you know, is that, how do we read that? Is that a figure for reading? Is it a figure of the limits of narration um, or the limits of knowing? Uh, and how does, the movement of the woman is quite ambiguous actually. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, 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 the sort of the 12, as they're called, the standing stones seem to follow her around. That, that's kind of hard to wrap your head around. But of course, we all get this from the narrator who himself seems to move, but we have no idea about how he's doing this. So we've got this entire kind of system of movement that happens outside of the mode of narration. That, that, that's intriguing. I haven't solved that problem, but I think that is the problem. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so also in Il Sin Il said, uh, we are at a historical impasse, I think. So stones, as we know, either do not have histories or have abstract histories. They don't arrive particularly at the history of stone. And also Beckett is entirely diffusing the history of the old woman. So, and we are in the presence of a burial ground, which is, of course, the end of history. Uh, uh, you know, a particular history or a history of a crowd, whatever uh, you call it. So is this another attempt by Beckett at the negation of human subjectivity by a renunciation of human history? Mm. Well, it's the end of a certain kind of history. Um, but, I, but the stones have their own history, of course. We've got, um, you know, the, we've got stones that have been shaped by human hands. We've got the standing stones, we have the gravestone, as far as we can make out, that's a gravestone that she's, that the woman is traversing the fields to visit. And of course, we have the flagstone outside of her hovel, which shows in its, it's worn in the middle. So we, we have this kind of history of use uh, inscribed in the stone, if you like. Um, so there are those kinds of stones with, the, with a kind of a, a history of human intervention. Um, 
and you have other kinds of stones appearing as well. And here, here's where it gets um, a little bit more interesting, I think, where you, you, if you remember, there are these um, white stones that kind of grow in the field. That they seem to be happening. They seem to be sort of being brought forth from the earth in a, an acceleration of geological time. Uh, every time you turn around, there are more of them for some reason. And that, so it's chalk, there's, it's an, there's an, a substrate of chalk. Um, so that, that's interesting for all sorts of reasons in that chalk isn't found in Ireland very much. So not that the setting has to be Irish. I mean, it has certain kind of um, an allure, that's, that's a, an alluring kind of way of thinking of it. But, but of course, there's no specification of that. We tend to think of chalk in terms of that, that band across the south of England, you know, from the Isle of Wight, the Needles and the, the White Cliffs of Dover and so on. Um, but anyway, chalk is the product of animal activity. It's, it's geological, but it's actually a product, an animal product. It's a bunch of crushed up shells that get compressed, of pretty small shells get compressed over eons and then produces, produces chalk stone. So um, this idea, this relation between living animals and geology, it's, you, you just have to adjust your sense of scale, I think, uh, to, to really get that to work. It's a little bit like, um, if you know, the, the very sort of eastern edge of the Italian Alps, the Dolomites, that's actually a coral reef that was on the, the sea floor many millions of years ago, and then tectonic movement has pushed it up into a, a mountain range. That's why it's so, um, stark and uh, it takes on the shape that it does. So there again, you've got a mountain range created by animals. And that, that's kind of mind blowing to think about that. But if you, if you factor in the geological timescales, then you know, that's something we can kind of get our heads around. But it does mean that you do have this relationship between stone and, and animality. And that's something that I think um, uh, yeah, this idea of renounce, I don't, wouldn't say it's a renunciation of human history. It's more like this recognition of the movement between life and stone, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a quote I take in the book from, um, from a, uh, a scholar who talks about the origin of the, the Greek word for um, grave, which is sema in Greek, and that, that also means sign. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like, it's the end of life, but it's also the beginning of language, if you like, and the beginning of signification. So again, you've got this sense of um, a, a, a kind of a renewal coming out of what seems to be terminal. Uh, right, so, so humans and stones are both affected by, and uh, both are meeting points of, uh, you know, various environmental and social and societal evolutions. Uh, so, so the indigenous Americans, for example, believe that the, Earth uh, was uh, and was a living, breathing entity using humans to their to their advantage, to her advantage. So, is this what Beckett's, Beckettian beings long for? You know, a life of hard, silent materiality, uh, conscious of its own living conditions. I mean, do they want to become like Earth or one with the Earth? Is what I'm trying to say. Mm. Yeah. Uh, th this idea of the Earth speaking, I think, is a really interesting one. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, what we can ascribe to, to Beckett's intentions is one thing, but uh, certainly being able to read land and earth as an act of what they call an actant in actor network theory, I, that's a really provocative idea. I, I, I love that idea, actually. I mentioned it in the book briefly, but I don't really get into it. I think that there's something you could really run with there. Um, uh, I, I'm minded, well, you mentioned Indigenous Americans, and I'm minded of um, certain examples a little bit closer to home where in Indigenous Australian um, practices, they obviously differ all over the country, but there is a sort of a commonality of being able to read the land for one thing, but the land is not, an, is not a passive text to be interpreted. Um, it's, it's very much a, an embodiment of the people and of their history. And it's not that they've inscribed their history, it's that sort of history has inscribed them in a sense. So you, you do have that kind of sense of, um, you know, dreaming tracks is, is one, one way of putting it, where you can read the landscape and read the history of your people 
by virtue of walking through the landscape. It's a very difficult thing for non-Indigenous people to even get their heads around in a, even the simplest kind of ways. Um, because we haven't, that's not our sort of epistemological practice. Um, and it hasn't been for, for the however many 70, 80,000 years of occupancy of this country. Um, so we're a long way behind in terms of trying to figure this out. But it is a way of conceiving of the earth as generative and as not something you react to, but something that you are a part of, I think. Um, it's a, it's a, yeah, that's, it's very difficult to put that into, I'm using the wrong language actually to put that into work, but that, that's, that's, um, I think a very provocative idea. Sorry, that's getting a little bit off track. That's sort of linking up with your indigenous American, um, idea of the, the living, breathing earth. Um, but, uh, yeah, this this idea of thinking of the earth as an actant, I think, has has real possibilities. That's a little bit closer to sort of um, the praxis that that we're more familiar with. I think mm -hmm. um, so. Bringing actor network theory into play there, I think, would be would be a really instructive thing. And actually seeing how that works with indigenous knowledges would be a fascinating um, experiment. I think actually. Right. Uh, so, so do you, again, do you think that this, this this tangible concrete silence, you know, emanating from the environment, uh, is responsible for the break, breakdown of the Beckettian language? Because of course, the characters are constantly breaking down, you know, bodily and uh, psychologically, and you know, and the language, of course, linguistically, of course. So, is it is it a, is it a counter to the silence of nature that that they are in the middle of so much silence or a different language? To which they have to communicate and the only way is perhaps breaking down the familiar language yeah the, well uh, thinking about how language is working in these three texts is these late texts is a pretty interesting exercise in that um perhaps the most radical example is worse would ho uh I, if i can speak out of school a little bit here i um, when i teach that text i preface it um by telling my students that it's made up of very simple English words, all of which they understand on their own, um, but it'll be the most difficult intellectual exercise of their entire degree, trying to get their heads around what's happening in Worst with Her. It's magic, um, these simple little words. Um, so what you have there, I guess, is a, uh, yeah, it's a process of breaking a language up in certain ways, but reconstituting it as well. And I think maybe there, the analogy with, um, deep time and uh, not only what happens with languages over time, uh, so that links up to a lot of the etymological um, stuff that I've got in the book, but also linking it up with de geological deep time as well, where you have cycles of, um, you know, uh, what would you say, things disintegrating and then coming back together in different formations. That, that's something that is definitely happening in Worstwood Ho. Um, in front of our eyes, you have you have language changing, like the meaning of words being reconstituted in different syntax and different scales of measurement, if you like, where you use a superlative to indicate a diminutive and vice versa, and that sort of thing. You know, to get to get to the the, the best least worst, if you if you know what I mean. You've got these seemingly contradictory terms that make sense actually within the kind of grammar of the of the text. So, but you have to do the hard work of recalibrating and leaving at the door your customary understanding of your own language mm -hmm. and trying to learn a new syntax, if you like, and learn a new sort of grammar of, of the language of the text. So there, I think you've got, you know, some surprising results, perhaps like those results of, um, in geology, where you figure out that certain kind of rock formations actually are, you know, were uh, vegetable matter in the case of, you know, petrified um, rock, um, petri petrified wood, um, or were animal matter in the case of chalk and, and limestone and various other kinds of rocks. So again, yeah, it's, it's again that, that matter of scale, I think, and trying to figure out the grammar of the situation you're looking at and the temporal scales, and often you'll have different scales sort of overlaid upon one another. That's the other trick with figuring out what's happening in these late texts, is that you'll have the scale of a, a lifespan, um, the scale of a species uh, and the scale of life itself. And then, then of course, sort of uh, geological and cosmological scales as well.
So all of those can happen, <laughs> can, they, they are all contemporaneous, it's just some peter out well before the others. All right. So, so uh, again, stones have memories, and, and Beckett's narrators, as you write in the book, uh, I quote, imagine themselves as stones, unquote. So is this desire also responsible for the motion towards, uh, let's say, non-being, uh, or an undistinguished thing, or a long stammer trying to reach the end of language? Yeah, question. I would think, um, I've been talking a little bit about how things can disintegrate and reconstitute. Um, uh, this, this idea of non-being as an object of, uh, that, that's become a, uh, quite an important um, object of, of criticism in, in Beckett's studies in, in recent decades. Well, non-being and, and also the, the non-human and the post-human. So obviously they mean different things, but there's a sort of a, a family sort of uh, collectivity there. Um, so yes, I think, I think this sort of intersects really nicely with what's happening in post-human theory and new materialism as well. That's something I've, I sort of deal with to, to a limited extent in, in the book. But um, this idea of non-being as a kind of a, a goal, I would see it, I would actually put it in these terms. I would see being and non-being are both transitive states. And th th it's all about transit, actually, moving from one to the other and, and moving through and moving out of and into. Uh, so, uh, you could apply that to Beckett's attitude towards prenatal memory and death uh, as well. They're not necessarily, um, you know, you never get to the final point in a Beckett text. It's always the penultimate moment, isn't it? You, ne mm -hmm. you never see the universe extinguished. You just, you're just on the precipice. It's like being on the event horizon of a black hole. You never quite pass over. Um, so again, there's always that possibility of regeneration and renewal and of, of things taking um, a reconstituted form. So again, yeah, that sense of transitiveness, I would say, is, is one way of thinking about that, rather than it being the end of language, it's maybe the end of a language or the end of a certain kind of structure of language, and then moving into the possibility of, you know, what, what is it to move past that into a, a new linguistic space? That's, that's what I think worse would have is, is the example in perhaps all of English literature that, that, that attempts that most earnestly and maybe most successfully, but we can argue about that. <laughs> um, so one more question definitely arises when we are investigating the stone, let's say. So, so you write about, uh, in your book, you write about the Scottish uh, sculptor and the Gold, Goldsworthy. Um, Goldsworthy's uh, observation, and I quote, a stone is ingrained with geological and historical memories. Unquote. So the paradox is perhaps concerning the reader or decoder of these memories. So, for example, who will read the fossils if everything and everyone is stone towards which the Beckett and characters are moving, let's say. And, you know, at this point, I, I find the Claire Cole book really helpful here. So are Beckett and characters uh, the future geologists then rereading the collective history of humans and rocks? Yeah, so, oh, sorry, I'm not, I don't know if I quite follow you there. So if, if, if humans are tending towards stone, who will then do the reading? Is that- Yes, who is who's reading? Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. what we find is this is a proliferation of stone, you know, especially mm -hmm. in Ilse said, you know, if it's a history of, uh, you know, humans, right? So who is going to come after that, you know, you know, what are we looking uh, at? It's perhaps a good question. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have an answer to that. Um, uh, I think we're dealing with the possibilities of character. So again, I'd be sort of making, it's not, it doesn't have to, it's not an absolute sort of category distinction, but the difference between persons and characters, I think is important here. So you'll still have readers um, who, are, who are more or less human the way we understand that term. But in terms of uh, reading the landscapes and reading the characters. I, again, I'd have to go back to the narrators. I think Beckett's modes of narration are well served by scholarship, on, you know, with regard to the major novels, the early novels, um, and even the mid-career stuff. But these late texts, I think it's, people have written some wonderful stuff about narration. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking of Porter Abbott's written some great stuff on on these texts, and um, 
who am I trying to think of? There, there, are, there are a number of other people who have done some really great stuff on this, but trying to figure out the, the narrator is trying to establish the terms of his activity in these, in these three stories. And I think that's, um, it's projected outwards into the creation of a world, a narrative world. But the question of that relationship between narrator and world is one that's, that becomes a, a very interesting one in that, you know, maybe it's a recognition of being entrenched in a language as though you're part of the linguistic landscape. So uh, it's not necessarily a, a literalized metaphor of turning into stone, but rather seeing yourself as embedded within something, within a linguistic kind of texture, if you like. And you're not helpless. You, you have agency and, and certain decision making processes you can employ, but you, you can't escape you can't escape language either. You know, that's, that's, that's the kind of the, the medium with which you have to work. So, um, yeah, could, do you mind ex sort of explaining a little bit about what you mean by using Claire Colbrook? Because I agree, I think her work's yeah. very... Yeah, very I, well. what, what I really wanted to say is, let's say uh, Colbrook uh, stresses a lot on the theory of extinction, that, you know, once humans are extinct, we have yeah. ourselves as you know facing extinction right and she, she she says that we have to look at what comes after extinction who's going to read what was once on earth is what Colbrook says you know that is the way out of the post-human you know the conundrum let's say so so let's say the victim characters are like stone because they're caught in the you know in the you know in the in the alphabet you know within the uh, you know trajectory of language Right, so they are like stone, but they're also trying to break free from that stone and become the other stone, let's say, which is freer and uh, has a language of its own. So I think there is some kind of, uh, I mean, uh, you to boil down the question to this aspect that what makes us so sure that what is speaking is human? You know, because he never establishes the narrator with physical features. So who guarantees that what is speaking is human is perhaps my question. Yeah, that's good. Uh, it, it language speaks, but we can't be sure of the characterological or human basis of that language. That's yes. absolutely right. Um, that's that's a great way of thinking of it. Um, yeah, that's it's it's about using a sense of imagination. This this may be impossible to do, but I think um, taking Colbrook's work and and using that this idea of the extinction. How does one conceptualize one's own extinction. It's pretty hard. Um, you can kind of think of an empty landscape or a landscape empty of certain species, I guess. But um, how does one then consider history and time functioning in a, in a world without our particular forms of agency? And that's something that happened before. Uh, we're, we're only a, a blip on the temporal um, you know, the, the, the whole business. Um, so uh, there's the dangers of anthropomorphizing um, what's happened in the past, but there is a certain kind of consciousness or constructiveness or, or um, movement that has led to certain pre-human um, structures on earth that we then come along and interpret. So maybe we're part of a similar kind of thing where what comes after, after the extinction, whether it's just us or most of, of life on earth as has happened five times before, um, it's hard for us to imagine th those who replace us and, and what that means. And we have a very kind of um, teleological or Whiggish sense of that. I mean, you get that in science fiction where the aliens are always smarter than we are because that's how it goes. You have this kind of progressive scale of intelligence. Um, and that too is perhaps about a, a kind of a constraint in our thinking. We, we, we can't think outside of that constraint because we've put ourselves at the top of that chain. And so, of course, whatever comes after us has to supersede us. And I think there, there may be some kind of um, way out of thinking along those lines. So yeah, Colebrook and also um, Donna Haraway as well, you know, the, the um, Kulu scene and that, that sort of stuff as well. Th thinking about you know, writing, what is it? Writing beyond the disaster and, yes, and that kind yes, of work. Yes. Yeah. 
but it, it's it's a thought experiment that that is perhaps impossible for us to carry out fully but it, but at least it's it's a, a kind of a challenge there for us to to attempt Right. Uh, so, so um, are stones and landscapes then representations of uh, Beckett antipathy and endurance, the two fundamental elements that he found in human lives? And you've you've put it uh, phrased it brilliantly in your book, and you've called it mineralogical muteness. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, again, I'd go back to this idea of the transitive. So, uh, stones and landscape. Um, sorry that you said antipathy and endurance yes yeah. antipathy and endurance yes yeah so mm, that yeah i'd still yes on on a human scale perhaps but on as a scale of deep time i think endurance becomes a much more transitive thing actually mm -hmm. so that that would be my that would be my answer um this duality of um to, to use a loaded beckett word the word on you reverse that and you get the word no. So, you know, it's a happy, happy occurrence in English. But that, that, that kind of transitiveness is sort of like on off or, or plus minus or, or what have you, uh, ones and zeros, from which one can generate an entire um, kind of apparatus or an entire world. Now, th this idea of um, something that might connect the human with some of what we've been talking about uh, with regard to uh, actor network theory and the stones having their own kind of sense of, of agency. Um, the, the idea of bearing witness, what that means, of course, to, to us takes on certain kind of fairly recognisable forms. But what does it mean for a hovel or a standing stone to bear witness? Um, that's something that has sort of vexed um, novelists and, and writers for a long time actually you know what is it to, to have these kind of non-animate figures that are there and present and bearing witness to something um what is what is one's relation to to that object and uh in in that kind of classic um mode well i don't know if that's been successfully uh, uh, sort of attempted, but certainly actor network theory does offer you a bit of a, a way into that question, I think, about how does one, you know, respectfully consider non-human or non-sentient uh, witness, witnessing. Right. So, uh, so it's very interesting to note that in all three novelas in Know How On, the first person is only indirectly referred to. So the narrator is both the observer and the interpreter and the one detecting the transformation of these characters into stone. So is this detachment between the seer and the seam also emblematic of the distance between man and his environment? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, I'll, I'll fall back onto something I've said already, which is that narration is the really uh, the, the conundrum, the most difficult aspect of working out uh, how to deal with these texts. Um, so the narrator, uh, or the, the, the narrators of these three texts, um, they're very self-conscious about their constraints, whether it's sight, knowledge, power, action, um, their ability to direct or build their world that gets <laughs> that they come up against certain limits. We're not quite sure what those limits are. Um, and even the ability to speak is they're all provisional attributes, it seems. So the narrator in each of these texts is himself also subject to um, certain kinds of limits. And we're not sure what where those limits are being imposed, whether they're necessary, whether they're just, you know, happenstance or what have you. But one thing that does sort of come up quite a bit is this idea of the narrative voice being primordial in some way. Um, and I'm thinking of um, one thing that kind of struck me when I looked again at these early, at these late texts is how much intertextuality there is and how much romanticism there is in these texts. That, that really got me. I mean, there are some really obvious examples on the text surface, but even if you start to sorry to use this metaphor, but if you start to dig a little bit, th there are a lot more that, that sort of come through. And um, I, I'm thinking of figures like um, in Shelley's Prometheus Unbound, you have the figure of uh, Demo Gorgon, who's not gendered, not really given a, a kind of a clear sense of identity, but is this kind of primal force that, that directs the action of that um, closet drama. Um, 
and this that's a really interesting figure to use because it, it it sort of ties in really nicely with what Beckett is doing with regard to intertextuality in these late texts where they're very very richly intertextual often just with a single word dropped in at an opportune location and you'll have this this kind of it's like blooms into this long lineage of, of intertextuality and the demo gorgon idea is one of them actually because that that that's something that um i had a look into this actually just earlier today i think it's statius in the fourth century is the first the first writer to mention this figure of demo gorgon and it's probably you know it's a pagan sort of adapt an understanding of a, a, a pagan entity in early christianity but it comes up um again in boccaccio in milton um and, and then in shelley so you've got this and shelley puts it to kind of political effect actually you know the demo gorgon is the spirit of the people the revolutionary spirit of the people if you like um that's that's certainly one dominant reading of his use of, of that figure in Prometheus Unbound. Um, but anyway, all of that sort of leading up to Beckett where this kind of suggestion of the narrator as being this kind of primordial voice, you get that in company, you do get that in ill seen, ill said, although the narrator is pressing up against the limits of that power. Uh, and then in Worstwood Ho, you certainly get that where this kind of narrator God um, is, is not completely in control of the situation, but is certainly located rhetorically as, as that kind of you know primordial force so i think i think there you've got if you like a in miniature you've got a history of of certainly western literature and the the, the coming to grips with forces that are not um conventionally theological forces the demo right. organs being something outside of that yeah Right. So, so somewhere in your book, uh, while discussing company, you refer to, to the Beckettian reader as the archaeologist engaged in excavatory politics uh, or excavatory poetics, uh, to say it properly. So could you shed some light on this statement on the excavatory poetics? Oh, certainly, yeah. So um, you can think of that in a few different ways. I mean, the obvious way in is to look at all of the imagery that, that Beckett uses in these texts. There's an awful lot of um, rock, stone, and kind of sculptural imagery. Um, the Memnon pose that you, ha you have in Il Seen Il Said, which is of course something that he's recycled from earlier texts. Um, and this idea of an effigy as well, this sense of creating to, to, to kind of speak of someone is to create almost to um, create a statue of them, if you like, or an image of them in, in effigy. Um, so this kind of so there are those kinds of really obvious ways of looking at um, at the earth and, a, and a, the, the use of rock imagery. But then you also have this idea you mentioned uh, I think earlier this idea of agriculture, mm -hmm. and there you have obviously the land, but it's not it's not rocks and sculptures and so forth. It's it's um, agriculture, and of course agriculture and literature are hand in glove. You know that's that's what you do if you're a um, an aspiring writer in you know ancient Greece or ancient Rome you would start off by writing Georgics you write about farming and that's how you sort of that's your apprenticeship and then from there you go on to didactic texts and then then finally if you're good enough you get to write your epic um, so writing and land and the cultivation of the land go go um, together um, and um, oh, there's a wonderful book called um, In the Vineyard of the Text by uh, Ivan Illich. And it's, it's a text about uh, Hugh of St. Victor's Didascalicon, so an, a, a sort of 12th century didactic text, uh, medieval text. Um, but in there, he traces the kind of the etymology of, um, of writing and the idea of the page, which is in Latin at least comes from the word pagina, which also refers, refers to the trellis. So cultivating, you know, it's not just growing grapes, it's cultivating grapes in a particular formation in a, in a grapevine on a trellis. That is the kind of agricultural figure for writing lines of text. So they're one in the, they're one in the same kind of trope, if you like, or the two parts of the same trope. So writing and agriculture, you know, do belong together um, in, in that kind of traditional reading. So, um, uh, sorry to get back to your question. <laughs> I got all excited about explaining that. Yeah. Um, 
what what was the it was an excavatory poetics oh sorry yes that's right um so yes you can read the language of the text in that excavatory way as well and uh something i, I did uh, a little bit of um in, in the book was to look at the etymology of certain kinds of words that beckett was using there are these loaded words like void and vast and so forth and by it, it just sort of struck me that there were echoes in all in those in the particular vocabulary he was using and once i started to look a little bit more closely i have no idea if this was motivated or accidental but almost all of them go back to figures of uh landscape and and physical space either uh waterways or um areas of land uh whether it's sort of uh, valleys or um crevices or, or what have you or uncultivated land uh, so vast, of course, is the origin of the word waste, which, you know, the, the wasteland. Um, so there you've got all sorts of, it, it's kind of like an archaeology of literary tropes, if you like. It's an archaeology of the language in a kind of a fairly literal sense. That's what etymology is. But it's also an archaeology of how literary tropes come to be and how they reflect upon their own practices of producing literature to then speak to and of certain kinds of uh landscapes and the people occupying those landscapes so that's where the 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 reader can become if you like that kind of metaphorical archaeologist um so it's not it's not it's not only looking at the the sort of the the memnon pose the, the grand statues and so forth it's also just the ground beneath your feet right uh, so so in ilsen ilsen Il said again so beckett seems more concerned with the lithic ontology so of the zone of stones as he says so while the old woman perpetually metamorphoses into one of the burial stones so more than an interrelational posthuman togetherness uh, i find the stones i personally find the stones extremely threatening to human existence so even the narrator is afraid to enter that zone so do you think beckett issues some kind of warning here rather than a togetherness you should, i don't know maybe mutual distance i don't know i mean well figuring out what those 12 stones are doing is is mm. the that's the key question <laughs> um i think it's fair enough to read that as threatening but i think it's a threat to the narrator um i think mm. the stones are companions and uh protective companions of the woman they follow her around and sort of guard her as she as she navigates this space so um yeah, there, there may well be a there's certainly reading threat into that is uh, i think very legitimate um but it's but maybe it's warning of the dangers of narrative presumption this is a narrator who's trying to pinpoint the woman what is she doing who is she mourning what does all of this mean what are her activities uh, actually all about how does she relate to the stones um, of all sorts in this landscape and the stones themselves are pushing back. <laughs> They're kind of shielding her from the narrator in a sense. Yes. So, uh, that, that actually might go back to your point of, you know, what happens when the stones start speaking back? They're not so much speaking, they're just sort of presenting a cold shoulder, if you like. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so, so, but uh, again, there's a paradox in the Beckettian characters desiring to be stones, let's say, or like the stones, because we know that stones are malleable too. They mutate over centuries of climatic changes. So the question is, what provokes this lithic inspiration in them? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I, I don't know if it's an inspiration or if, I mean, it, attributing some kind of volition to that is quite tricky because the language isn't, specific enough for us to tell whether um, becoming stone is something that is desired or willed or if it's something that just occurs if it's just sort of this inevitable process um, so um, yeah it's very difficult to know what kind of uh, volition to attribute to that but um, i was thinking just on a sl slight tangent um, I'll have to bring in Ezra Pound here at some point, so I'll do it now. Um, there's his very early poem, The Tree, and um, it's, uh, I, I once stood still and was a tree, uh, knowing the truth of things unseen before. It's a wonderful couple of lines because he doesn't, he doesn't even turn into a tree. He stood still and was a tree. Um, so we don't know about any sense of agency or volition or anything like that. But what it allowed him to do, that change of state, was to see things that unseen before. Um, and, you know, this is, this is uh, kind of an Ovidian 
trans, you know, metamorphosis from human into, into plant life. Um, but can we imagine what new things we might see if we were stone? This again is this kind of imagination of, you know, what, what would it be to bear witness as an actant that is a non-human, non-sentient actant? What is it that, and of course, we're surrounded by a world that's doing this all the time. We have no idea exactly what's, what they're doing and what's going on. So, um, yeah, that, that idea of um, lithic inspiration, it's, it's also the inspiration to think lithically. I mean, that, maybe that's a contradiction. Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. stone, to, to think as stone is, is a kind of only a metaphor, but um, to imagine what it might be to bear witness in that kind of inanimate form. What, what would that mean to do that? Um, right. So, so again, so is there a clash between the archetypal image of stone as symbols of mythological and real permanence, of course, and the indefiniteness of the indefiniteness or, or the finitude of being and language? Let me think. Um, oh, sorry. The, is there a clash between? Between between the between the stones as the, archety the archetypal image of stones as symbols of mythological and real permanence, oh, yeah, yeah. and the finitude of being and language. Mm. Yeah, I, I think uh, again I'd go back to that idea of transitiveness and and scale as being essential there. And uh, certainly on a if you don't adjust scale, and of course you have to make a massive adjustment for for scale, then. Um, that may not be apparent, but, but stone is transitive, just like human life is transitive. Um, and so in that sense, I don't think it's necessarily a clash. Um, it's a matter of change, but obviously on different scales. Um, of course, there's a tr long tradition of stone speaking as well. Um, you've got the, um, the Hermi, those sorts of protective um, sort of, they're not quite sculptures, but they're human heads on square blocks along roadsides. Uh, that's, a, that's an old Greek thing. Um, there, there are various other ways in which statues speak. Um, um, one, one of our participants knows a lot more about that than I do. Um, Jess, with your, your work on the speaking stones or the speaking statues of Rome. Um, yeah, so there's, there is a tradition of, of stones or stone objects speaking. Um, uh, so again, I would say that's a way of circumventing this kind of, you know, binary logic of, of you know, muteness and um, volitional speech. So, uh, right. So in words for ho, uh, words form like a cosmogony and corrode like a geological erosion. So the page itself becomes an agricultural field on which, to quote your phrase, in fact, uh, it becomes a te geotextual record is farmed, Beckett is farming on the page as it. So why is Beckett comparing a thoroughly linguistic act like writing uh, with an utterly non-verbal one of tilling or earth formation? Yeah, oh, that, I would just go back to that, that what I said before about um, cultivation, agriculture and writing, how they're, um, they're hand in hand. This idea of the figures of cultivation and of agriculture become metaphors for the figures of writing. So this idea of the vine, the text is a vine that you, you um, set up on a trellis on the page. I mean, this is a, this is a kind of an ancient and, and it's, it's a pre-modern idea really. Um, although you may be able to adapt it to the printing press, but certainly if you're thinking about a monastic, a monastic scriptorium where you're, um, firstly you have a heavily illustrated page, but also you have very strict delimitations of how you, you cultivate, you know, the, the, the text on the page. Um, that, that translates very well with um, kind of metaphors of agriculture, I think. Um, how you would do that in a post hot press production <laughs> of text, just, uh, I'm not sure you can, but, but certainly there's a long history of that. So um, th these texts were not written in the digital age uh, fully fledged. So I don't have to answer that, que that aspect of the question. But yeah, it's that, that relationship between agriculture and writing, I think is very deeply entrenched. And Beckett makes sure that, uh, or the texts ensure that, that that connection is very firm in terms of the vocabulary and the imagery that, that he uses uh, in them, so those word choices. There, there's, a, there's an uncanny number of words seemingly innocent on the surface and they all relate back to um, uncultivated land or 
farming or you know matters of the earth it's it's quite quite uncanny uh, right. So, so could this be a possibility that Beckett is seeking to exhibit the overwhelming presence of geological thingness amongst us? So that, that nature is the only valid historical document of humans, that instead of us reading the stone, the stone reads us back. Yeah, yeah. That, that idea of, well, that's maybe what the stones are doing, and you'll see and you'll see, they're reading back. They're reading back against the narrator. Um, that, that idea of geological narration, I think, is a wonderful, um, wonderful idea. Um, I didn't know if this would be useful or not, but I'll, it's, this is the moment. Um, I don't know how, how many of you are familiar with this book, The Planet in a Pebble. It's by Jan um, um, Zalasevich, I would pronounce his name as. And it's basically a history of the world uh, and a history of the practice of geology via a pebble taken from a Welsh beach. And from that, telescopes uh, a world, essentially. So here is an example of, it's not the, sp the stone speaking <laughs> utterly on its own, there, it's ventriloquized perhaps, but it's a really good example, I think, of um, how uh, you know, we're thinking of it in a different way to indigenous knowledges, but it, but it's a, but in, in a sense there is a, a slight relationship there in terms of how one sensitively reads the stone and and makes um, makes available the story that it has to tell. Yeah. Right. So, so doing that in fiction is a different thing. This this is of course you know uh, popular science, but um, doing it in fiction is a different thing. But maybe through the you know the relationship between subjectivity and the objects of language you know the the word objects uh, as well as um the, the the ostensible objects in the narrative um and seeing the words as actants as well as the the objects that we read through the words you know into the narrative as actants as well i haven't really thought that through fully but maybe that's the maybe that's the point at which you know the this this idea of um you know, a, a calculus, you know, this sort of operation that also puns on the origin of the word calculus, which means, you know, it's a stone image again. Um, so there, it's, we're still dealing with it from the human side, but there is a sort of an, a recognition of a stone's ability to speak to us, if only we learn how to listen. Right. So, so my last question for the day. So, so do you think that Beckett's engagement with the geological time and deep life is also a quest to return to post-human or rather pre-human plurality? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, a few scholars have really taken that up, this idea of Beckett and the post-human, which I think is a really very, very interesting area and one which has a lot left to run in it. Um, certainly, Beckett and the Anthropocene, Beckett and Extinction. Um, I guess what I'm doing here, dealing with geology, is somewhat cognate with that. Um, yeah, just to sort of sum up, I guess, though, this engagement with geological time and whether that's post-human or pre-human, again, it's, it's um, I think, open to post-human theory but in turn, I would argue on the matters of scale, you have both actually. You have this idea of the scale of the human life that often is the subject, the ostensible subject of narration, particularly getting towards the end of life, whether it's Malone dies or you'll see Neil said or what have you, um, happy days. You know, you could name a thousand different, many different texts that, that would fit that. Um, but you also have the life of the species, the li life itself, and then planetary and cosmological time. So you've got different scales going on there. And that, you know, recognizing more than one scale changes, I think, uh, the terms of thinking about pre, um, you know, post-human or pre-human, actually. Um, of course, we're we're stuck in the human, so we that's what we have to deal with. But we can radiate outwards. We can radiate our attention outwards and do some pretty spectacular things with um, uh, certainly knowledge, but also in in literary terms as well. You know what it might mean to to think past some of those uh, lim temporal limitations. So linking it back to Beckett, well, look, I'd I'd say there's a, there's an awful lot of the business of the ending of life, but there's also the prenatal memory and this idea of 
pre, um, pre, pre conscious or a, a consciousness before, um, uh, before birth and that sort of thing. So, so he's kind of got both things going on and this I, I'd say this idea of transitivity is what connects them all actually. So it's, it really is about um, this sense of the prenatal and death sort of, you know, w working in symbiosis, if you like. I wouldn't say it's dialectical. I'm not quite convinced of that, but certainly working in symbiosis. Um, and, you know, going, going back to my argument in, in the book, um, I'm talking about these late texts as being a kind of um, a critical reflection upon his writing career, a critical reflection upon literariness and literary um, uh, canons, um, mostly English, but, but, but um, others, but classical and French canons as well. Um, and, and the, the textures of writing, so the history of his own language. Uh, I've just stuck to the English, uh, to English etymology. Um, two, two of the three were written in English first, thankfully, but um, it'd be interesting to do a, a, a francophone uh, etymological analysis of these three, these three texts. Certainly the two that he translated himself, company, and um, of course, Il Sinil said was written in French first. Um, yeah, so th there is this kind of sense of scale operating uh, with regard to the figure of the writer and the producer of texts as well, the producer of language. So you've got that kind of, you know, geological or, you know, terrestrial kind of scales going on, but then you've also got this happening sort of, you know, within this kind of the, within the construction of a writer and a writing oeuvre and a, 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 and, a, and a connection of that to, you know, uh, a literary canon and, and that sort of thing. So we do have these kinds of cycles always bringing us back. Um, we're never firmly in the one location. And even when you get to the end of a narrative, as with Worst Would Ho, you've got a potential world to you peer through that pinhole and there could be an entire world projected for you there. That's where you get at the end. It's, it's almost like, you know, the big bang and the big, big crunch, those kinds of theories. We need Roger Penrose here to talk about it today. Um, but that idea that the, current, the theory is that the current universe is the product of a collapsed previous universe that then produces the singularity that becomes the, the big bang. So, it, you know, the pinhole at the end of Worsford Home might be the literary kind of equivalent of that perhaps. That's, that's a very grandiose way of um, attributing <laughs> Beckett's final text, but anyway. I'll... <laughs> okay. mm. All right, right, thank you, Professor Byron. Now the floor is open for questions. Uh, anyone can ask uh, uh, either in the chat box or using the mic, anything else? Yeah. Other questions, please? Oh, yes, James has a question, sorry. Um, thanks very much, James, um, and thanks for your kind words. Um, do, do, should I read it out or? Please, 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 go ahead, or should I? Okay. okay, so do you think that if we consider Beckett's oeuvre as a whole, as a cosmo, cosmogonic, cos, how would you pronounce that? Cosmogonic, um, I think. Cosmogonic, yeah, etymological yes. writerly thought experiment, I'm with you. Is he in some way reflecting on something like Schelling's notion of the, oh, here we go. <laughs> of the, um, run, as the original abyss of creation or something like the platonic Cora. Yeah, well, certainly some of the metaphors of um, rifts and divisions and uh, th the idea of division and coming together. Um, there's, there's a word that he uses a lot that does both of those things. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm struggling to remember which word it is now, but there's, there's a word that does this. Um, it talks about um, dividing but also uniting at the same time. So this idea of the pr productiveness of, of language and the productive, productiveness of literature coming about by virtue of um, something that's riven but then, then reunited. Um, so yeah, I think definitely I'm, I'm a little bit fuzzy on my memory of the Platonic Cora, but there's definitely a, a productive link there, I think, absolutely. Uh, in terms of Schelling, gee, <laughs> should, should I pretend to moonlight as a German romanticist? I think that's a very, very sketchy thing for me to try to do. But again, yeah, you know, this, um, there was that wonderful uh, issue of um, Samuel Beckett today, aujourd'hui, on Beckett romanticism, all Sturm and no drum. Um, 
And there are a couple of essays in there on German romanticism. And I am sure there's still a lot more to be plumbed there. The visual arts, yeah, we've pretty much got that. And, and maybe the poetry more or less, but in terms of the philosophy, ooh, I think there's still a lot to, to, to work on there. So um, th this idea of the original abyss of creation, I'm, I'm just going back to, th this is a real abomination to do this when you're talking about Schelling, but I, I'm, I was minded, um, it, it's, that that section in um, Heidegger's essay, uh, The Origin of the Work of Art, where he talks about the ground, the Abgrund and all of that sort of business, where it's uh, about rifts and divisions and so forth, but it's also the blueprint from which, you know, literature and language is productively produced. So that's, that's kind of the Heideggerian sort of post version of that. But I think the Schelling stuff is far more interesting and I'm, I'm far, less capable of you know, elaborating on that. Um, James, I dare say you know a lot more about that than I do, but I reckon that's an absolutely wonderful, um, I think there's, there's something really serious to do there, in other words, yeah. Um, so yeah, surfaces and depth, I mean, that's something that comes through. Whenever you think you're dealing with a text surface, all of a sudden you've got depth, whether it's temporal depth, you know, deep time, or whether it's spatial depth or metaphors or etymology or what have you, you know, you, you think you're on, I can't help but use these metaphors now, it's terrible. You think you're on firm ground, but then all of a sudden it's the Rocky and Bullwinkle thing. You're taken down subterranean in a subterranean space and then you sprout up like a bunch of, it's um, sunflowers, isn't it, in that, um, I think, Rocky and Bullwinkle, they come up in a field of sunflowers. I think that's right. Um, yeah, so that, that kind of cyclicity of between surface and depth. Um, but yeah, Schelling, definitely. I, I, would, I would love to hear an intelligent person's uh, <laughs> thoughts on that question. Um, I'm, I'm not the one to, to do it, I don't think, except to, you know, heartily endorse the idea. So, yeah, Orko has a question, I think. Orko, oh, sorry. Orko. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, should I read it? Um, yeah, okay. Should I read it? It may be if you read it. Yeah, okay. Uh, so so uh, Orko asks that he was wondering uh, about the different modalities of self-excavation and uh, with and without the geological trope. So he says, for example, the drafts of stirring still, he goes back to a sentence from what, but there is no geology in that self-excavation. Yes, absolutely. That's a really good question. Um, so th this is where, it's worth being quite careful in how one's using one's geological terms um, because sometimes it is a very literal kind of situation where you're talking about, you know, um, Enil Senil said you've got the, um, the coffer, that, uh, which is obviously related to coffin and therefore, you know, interment and, and excavation. So you've got those kinds of clues or, or objects given to you that directly relate to, to those physical processes. Um, and and Oko's come up with a, a really wonderful example where there's no explicit sort of mention of geology at all. Um, yeah, I mean, there's to talk about in terms of memory and um, the unconscious and that kind of excavatory sense of psychoanalysis. I mean, there, there are the famous sort of examples of that in, um, what's the Freud one? Um, I can't remember the essay now, but um, there, there's a famous kind of, trope of an archaeological dig as a way of sort of speaking about what it is to, you know, move through, um, you know, an exploration of the, the, um, the psychoanalytic process. So um, there I would say, to an finally answer your question, um, there, there is this kind of excavation of one's own uh, corpus, one's own literary corpus going on there. So it's about, um, you know, the fossils or the process of recycling. Um, what is a really wonderful text for that? Because stuff in the published text gets reused in later texts, but there's an awful lot of stuff in the manuscript that doesn't necessarily translate directly to later texts, but obviously feeds into them. Um, and there you're talking about, uh, uh, it's, it's a more metaphorical way of talking about geology, but certainly there's this idea of, um, you know, an archive, if you like, an archive as an archaeological site, and that whether it's a physical archive or a mental archive, um, and we do that with intertextuality as well. We're you know dredging up um, uh, images from other texts and and using them as uh, you know purposively in in our in our work. Um, 
and here he's doing it's an auto sort of intertextuality if you like he's going back to an earlier text and taking something from that something that's kind of buried if you like and then and they're reanimating it um like the the Lao Kun statue you know there it was in the soil for 1500 years and then in this what is it the early 16th century they dig it up and uh, th there you have it and of course that happens with literature as well thinking of um what would be a good example of that um uh the epic of gilgamesh would be one example you know a, an epic that's lost for um for hundreds of years and then it's discovered at the beginning of the 20th century um and uh, there are a couple of other good examples of that as well um so again you've got these kinds of metaphors of excavation and um you know, archaeological digging that then allows for something new to happen as a result. It's a new sort of contribution to knowledge. So for Beckett, he's using that creatively. Um, in the book, I talk about one a very famous example, the um, uh, Oxyrhynchus manuscripts. A lot of these are in Oxford now. And that was basically a rubbish dump in Cairo, in the suburbs of Cairo. And a um, hundred years ago, a couple of archaeologists went there and found amongst the, the the rubbish they you know did a, an archaeological dig of a rubbish dump and found all of these um there was a lot of um legal notifications and that sort of stuff but there were also copies of um sappho and aristotle and all this sorts of stuff some of it was quite new some of it was had didn't have witnesses um in existence so it added to the corpus of classical knowledge literally sifting through the rubbish so they're the kind of archaeological and geological metaphors, you know, in terms of um, stratigraphy and that sort of stuff, uh, very, um, uh, I, th I think they're quite applicable um, in that kind of way. Right. The, the Freud's essay you were referring to, is it the etiology of history, hysteria you're referring to? The etiology of hysteria, where he- Oh, that's the one, yes, thank you. I, it slipped yeah. my mind. There, there's that wonderful passage at the start where he's talking the about- Hunter, you know, the Sassel Yeah, you can either yes. sort of observe that there are these kind of ruins and keep walking, or you can stop and do a little bit of an excavation, find out from the locals what they understand, and then all of a sudden the larger structure comes into view and, th and you have perhaps uh, knowledge of a lost uh, phase of civilization on your hands. Okay, so so any other questions from anyone? Otherwise, we'll close the session. Um, someone writes that uh, cool to think about how. Okay, as to how culture is writing. Okay, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, okay, okay. Oh, well, could I just? I'll just say one thing. If um, yeah. if anybody wants to follow up on anything with regard to this, or you know Beckett generally, then. Um, Asajid, if you want to, uh, if people contact you for my email address or something, I'm pretty Absolutely. easy to find anyway, but um, certainly I'd be happy to, to sure. correspond. With sure, and this will be uploaded on YouTube as well. They'll, they'll, they'll oh, get exactly. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so thank you so much, Professor Byron, for your uh, geological reflections on Beckett in condition, Beckett in textuality, and problems of narrational agency. So I hope we'll have some sessions uh, with you again in the near future. And thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for being so patient and cooperative. Absolutely, yes. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I see we have a few time zones going on here, so it's uh, <laughs> much appreciated. <laughs> James, I think, gets a special mention. You might, you might be in the least conducive time zone out of anybody here. <laughs> thank you. I, I especially appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Baron. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank, thanks so much, Asajid. I really appreciate it. So, um, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Good morning, evening, afternoon, yeah. everyone. It's 3 a.m. <laughs> okay, James. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yes.